Welcome to Alpha Centurion. I will be your guide. So we are doing the Council of Trent. This is session six. We are in chapter five, Predisposing Grace. I hope my snowball mic is still working well. So Predisposing Grace. This one's going to be maybe a little bit of a longer video just because there's a lot to read out of just because there's a passage to read out of Matthew. But anyway, here's what Trent has to say on predisposing grace. Many will be called, some will answer, few will be chosen. Or as Trent puts it more succinctly, first called, then freely assent, then cooperate with. And yes, I'm paraphrasing, but you know. All right, so now let's see where Trent is getting this idea. Uh, again, I would like to remind you, please, if you are watching this video, please buy this book so you can read along with me. Uh, it's really good. So Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 through 14. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent over servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servant, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. And he sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good alike so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him out into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I want you to notice that not everyone who is rejected or everyone who turns away from God is necessarily evil. Some only go back to their business. Others go back to their farm, so they go back to work. So they're not being evil, they just don't want to attend. But still in that choice, they're rejecting the king and they're rejecting the wedding of his son. The next set are the evil people who actively go against God or actively go against the king. Those are the ones who do evil, the wicked. Then of the people who answer the call, not all of them are of equal stature. And the, while they all get to go to the wedding feast, some get rejected by God because some of them did not come in the right garment, in the right um, attire. They didn't come to celebrate the wedding. They just wanted the feast. They wanted the food. So just because you're called doesn't mean you're going to be chosen. And just, and just because you're called doesn't mean that you will answer the call. Okay, that's very important. And it goes very much against Calvinism, by the way, and some other forms of Protestantism. So the question then arises, why all aren't universally saved if absolute universal salvation is available. See, it's available, but not everyone is saved. The answer is that absolution, salvation, and justification can be ignored, can be rejected, and can be refused by both action and inaction. Remember, not all of those who turned away from God, not all of them did something evil. Some of them just chose not to attend. They chose not to answer the call, not just actively um, go against what God had said. 
this ability to accept or reject salvation is this ability to accept or reject salvation this capacity to obey or disobey god's will as explained within the text of the council of trent can be called free will for modern arguments uh, when you're talking with atheists or with uh, non-catholics who don't believe in free will this is not an argument for more than that that's very important nor is it an argument against predestination the bible affirms predestination so as a good as a catholic in good standing you can't uh, discount that but if nothing else we as functional capable and able human beings at least have free will in this alone to accept or reject salvation and to obey or disobey god's will so when a catholic or a theologian is speaking of free will we're not speaking of absolute free will. We're speaking about free will in a very specific instance. That is to accept or reject salvation and the free will to obey or disobey God's will. That's it. We're not making a stronger claim than that. Now, some of us, like me, might believe in a stronger version of free will, but that's not what the argument is coming out of Trent. Now, you might be saying, well, where's your proof of that? Well, again, we have a biblical text to back this up. We're going to go to Zechariah. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts proposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. And again, all of this is coming from the ESV translation. Um, I do prefer the NAB and I do prefer the NRSV. But since I'm hoping to get a broader audience, I'm using the ESV. And then lastly, on this idea of predisposing grace, we're going to go to Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. So there's options here, there's choices. Yes, God can save, but we can choose to um, reject that salvation. Or we can be saved and then we can mess up. But then, as the Bible itself states, God can save us again. God can restore us even after we fall. Again, this is biblical. I understand if you're reading Trent and you're a Protestant and if you're reading a bare document or you're reading a second or third hand account of Trent, you're not going to see these Bible verses. They're just not presented. It's just a group of men making a declaration, saying they're teaching and correcting, and that's it. And so you, you're like, well, where are they getting this from? They're just making an opinion. They're just giving an opinion. It's just a man, and it's not coming from the Bible, but it is coming from the Bible. It is. It's just they're not giving the quotes because at this point in history, they saw themselves in a very hierarchical um, organization and i know that doesn't seem right to you as a protestant especially an american evangelical or an american fundamentalist or an american free church person or a non-denominational person you don't see these hierarchies like this but at this time this was not just common for the church in theological circles or in orthodox and catholic circles or in even uh, islamic circles no this is true for society there's monarchies there's empires where everything is seen in hierarchies where the peasants are are the lowest of the low and the laborers are, are under them and below that are, are your slaves and then all the way up you're going to have you know the kings and the and the top you know the the dukes and everything else so all the metaphors and all the analogies are set up in this structure and the catholic church and the 
15, what, 46, 1550s, they're using this, this same language, even though the rest of the world is about to kick off a long revolution of throwing off monarchies. But for the church at this time, they're looking at the last 1,500 years. They're looking at 2,000 years before that. And they're saying, this is how the structure of society works. So this is how we are going to instruct our people. We're going to do it top down. We're not going to give an explanation. We're going to give a judgment. And we're going to say, if you want to be in the right, you have to do what we say. If you read the modern catechism, it's not like that. The modern catechism does a lot of explaining. This, a lot of this is in the catechism, but it's explained. Here, it's not. Here, it's just the judgment, and you're good to go. Obviously, Protestants rejected that. But I think if they could see the Bible verses that are backing up a lot of the claims that are made here, a lot of the judgments and rulings that are made here, maybe those divisions would not have been as sharp or as dramatic. Of course, that's just my opinion. Um, all right, see you in the next video.